Hey, welcome back, everybody. It's time again for one of our favorite shows this week with Wendy. The only show that shows you the real deal, the real talk about SoCal a state of mind with your host, Wendy Ross, who after decades of working at real estate brokerages in Silicon Valley, Orange County, everywhere, decided it was time to create a different real estate model. And so she did. And thus was born Veracity Real Estate. The time was ripe for a renewed commitment to bespoke client advocacy at all price levels. Yes, we said all price levels. Something you seldom see in high cost communities like Southern California. Through all this, Wendy has built a company of data-driven real estate investment advisors who are truth seekers and truth tellers and truth be told, I can't wait to hear what she has to say each and every week here. So let's jump into it. Wendy, what truths are you going to reveal to us today here? Hey, Paul, how are you? <laughs> Good. You really are a truth seeker. You got me thinking every time one of these shows happens, not just from your weekly report, which I find amazing, Thank but you. some of the wide range of guests you bring in here, like today's guest here, too. Mark is amazing. He's just another example of all the things we don't know, which is why we surround ourselves with experts. And you know me. I, I'm a data nerd, and I, I lead a team of data nerds. You and do. We're out there trying to bring market analysis and, and insights that people don't find anywhere else. And, and a large part of how we do that is by surrounding ourselves with um, novel and educated and super smart people. Like and Mark. I think forward thinking, you know, mm. too many people, real estate's always a backward looking thing. What was it last year? What was it 10 years ago? And then they try, try and project forward. But we're in uncharted territory, I think. We absolutely are. Good heavens. I mean, I every day i wake up and i think it's groundhog day because it's just more of the same madness but it's madness that we've never seen in our real estate marketplace ever I mean, this truly is unprecedented and then you know it, it, having it have been induced by a pandemic i mean did any of us in this room ever think in our lifetimes we'd be going through living through a pandemic never. and acting like it was normal never no it's bizarre it, it's absolutely bizarre but anyway it, Part of how we bring insights about how to make your home the greatest investment it can possibly be is by surrounding ourselves with people, again, like Mark. Mark is brilliant. Um, he is the Director of Renewable and Energy Efficiency Services at Energy Experts International. And we're going to hear all about him and that company today. He's got a fascinating career that spans two countries. So yet again, we have someone else who has an international perspective. He was born in Calgary, Canada. He started his professional career in the oil and gas industry. So he's come a long way. And my favorite part about his story is that he started in Canada and he chose to move to California for love. So he's now married to a wonderful woman and he has two delightful young ladies as daughters. And, uh, and it impacted his career in that he was taking a look at the oil and gas world and reflecting and thinking he wanted to make an important difference by making the planet a better place for his girls. He wanted to leave a legacy of betterment um, and that's who we want to be with this is who we want to talk to this is who we want to embrace and, and support and i cannot wait to share his story so that started in 2007 this epiphany if you will and by 2009 he got some education under his belt in the energy efficiency world and he started consulting and in 2014 he actually approached the president of energy experts international with an idea and a relationship was born he's been there ever since as their director so tons of information, tons of insight. And to your point, Paul, he's a trailblazer, forward thinking, leading us down the right path. Thank goodness. So enough about Mark for just a minute. We're going to get back into all things Mark, Mark Brenner and energy related. But for a minute, as you know, I'm going to do a quick recap of what happened last week. So it, this is kind of Groundhog Day, like we were talking, you know, before we started the show. It's a little bit boring. And then I keep saying, yeah, OK, we we're selling too much of too little. It, and I have to give you some perspective. Last week, we had 305 new housing listings come on the market, which is actually up 9%, which is fabulous. But we put 444 under contract, so that was also up 5% over the week before. 375 listings sold, that was up 3% over the week before. So yes, we do want to see this kind of momentum happening week after week as we, end, as we enter the spring and summer market. But the challenge is we're so under inventory that we need more, we need about 2,000% more inventory. It, it's, a, it's a grotesque number, our shortage. The, it only took us eight days to sell in median, and that was up 14% because it was seven days the week before. It, and mind you, in historical perspective, 
this really should be 45 to 50 days. It's taking eight. It's nuts. The median price wobbled a little bit in Orange County. It was at 925000 That was down 3% from the week prior, but we can't pay too much attention to this. These numbers are going to wobble week to week because there are so few numbers. It skews the median kind of radically. We have to look at this in quarterly and annual terms. But the list price to close price ratio was still reflective of a hot market. Things on average sold for 103% of asking. So the fever is there. And, and again, what I'm trying to tell people is we're not sort of under inventoried, under inventoried, we're grotesquely under inventoried. As of this morning, I did a quick check. We had 1,366 homes available to purchase in the entire county. Normally, we would have 7,000. We are 80% under inventoried. So anyone who is out there waiting for the market to crash and burn before they buy, stop it. I mean, you can wait. I'll make more money with you later because it will just be more expensive, but it's not going to serve you or your family. So stop waiting. It, we've already shown it, at the close of January, we sold 1,768 homes. Our historic average is 1,800 to 2,000, but we normally have 7,000 to pick from. So the heat is here. The heat is here to stay. It's boring. It's Groundhog Day. So enough. Moving on. I'm bored with my job already. We're moving on to Mark. So welcome, Mark. Thanks Hi. for being here. Thank you for having me. I really am excited about being here. I'm excited to have you share your story. And, and I feel really fortunate that you're here because I'm talking about homes and housing, and you do a lot of work with really large corporations and in the commercial world. So can you help us understand how homeowners can benefit from your expertise? Yeah, especially with the numbers that you were saying, talking about this morning, there's a lot of homeowners uh, whose homes have not been, we'll say, tweaked. They have not <laughs> become uh, energy efficient, or they aren't as any energy efficient as they should be. And with that um, comes a lower selling price, as people may not think about it because the home, they can get lots of money for their houses now, mm -hmm. um, but they're competing against homes which are energy efficient. And that's if you had to pick point. a house that's two doors down from you, mm -hmm. or from two doors down from the one you're looking at mm -hmm. to buy, and it doesn't have solar or the windows aren't you know low e3 uh or you know there's leaks between the doors and the casings all those things people you know buyers notice those kinds of things and they think how much do i have to spend in order to upgrade the house they do and and speaking of all those things that, that i see every day because you know it, it's it's my nerdy job to, to look for you know efficiency losses and 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 in all of those upgrades can you tell me how does energy efficiency advancements relate to say technology like like we know if our iphones are three or four years old they're ancient um do energy efficiency standards change that rapidly as well you've heard of artificial intelligence yes okay that's exactly what's happening in this industry every day there are new products that are that are available or that are hitting the market uh where uh for instance now this is more on the commercial side mm -hmm. but uh, anyone that has driven out to Las Vegas or Palm Springs has seen those behemoth yes. wind turbines. Mm -hmm. um, well, those wind turbines have shrunk in size now. So commercial enterprises, even homeowners, uh, can put these wind turbines, because they're six feet or less in height, and they can be put on top of commercial properties. They can be, you know, situated on, on platforms, you know, in Typically not for homeowners, but they can be if it's someone that's got some land and they can be set set outside. So that's it doesn't have to be their feet. Yeah, they can be, they're smaller than six feet tall. So, and we tend to like slip and, and fall onto the whole cliche of all things solar, but that's wonderful to talk about, you know, using the wind power as well. Right. right. So, so technology is, is evolving, is advancing so, so quickly. I mean, even, you know, you look at the price of electric vehicles mm -hmm. um, and how expensive they were. And cer certainly new ones that are coming out are expensive, but the price point is dropping dramatically all and the time. you're right. And remember back in, I'm going to age myself here, but back in the 80s and things when VCRs right. came out and they were right. huge and they were expensive and, and now they're practically a disposable item. Right. Planned obsolescence ex ex exists in this industry just as it does with televisions or, or audiovisual or anything else. Something I hadn't considered. So, and it's interesting because again, as a homeowner, we're primarily concerned with, you know, our little world and our homes and our efficiency and the net net bottom line um, is usually how do we save money? Right. You know, is there a tax advantage to getting these enhancements to our homes? And of course, how does it impact our utility bills? And, sure. and why are utility bills going up? What's going on? Well, 
Um, for those who aren't familiar with uh, their local utility, they are not your friend. Yeah. Uh, it is their business to make money. And historically, they have been able to increase their rates, which you as consumers get to pay, uh, by more than 7.5% a year for at least the last 25 years. And they get that because the California Public Utilities Commission reviews the, rep the requests by the various utilities. And then they say, okay, you can have X, 7%, mm -hmm. 5%, 6%. And so the rates are high, not only because the PUC, the CPUC, uh, approves those rates, but sometimes they don't approve what the utilities have come to them with uh, as their request. And so what they do is they will uh, tier shave uh, or they will reduce rate uh, tiers. So uh, what I'm saying is, is that for those that may remember, not that long ago, uh, people that were in either San Diego Gas and Electric Territory or, or SoCal Edison mm -hmm. uh, Territory had five tiers of electric rates on their power bills. I remember that. Well, then that got dropped down to three. Mm -hmm. And then the utility, uh, and that was a way of being able to increase prices because those people that basically were, I'll call it living in the tier one, mm -hmm. suddenly the amount of electricity that they were using on a monthly basis would no longer fit into that tier one. So they were being pushed into tier two. So, and then another iteration of that was the utilities decided because they couldn't get as much money out of the, out of the uh, CPUC as a rate increase, they would reduce the size of the tier. And so people now that were living in tier one were now doing most of their, they were spending most of uh, their electrical costs in tier two it's or tier three. It's diabolical. Yeah, that's why I say they're not your friend. Well, it's interesting because I think I naively thought, and, and I, I fancy myself a smart person, I naively thought that public utilities would be more regulated um, and not necessarily a not, pro not for profit, but not for scandalous profit, but that is naive. Well, it's not so much that it's naive. I mean, it is their business model to make money. Mm -hmm. And yes, they are regulated. However, there's a lot of leeway in that regulation. Interesting. And, and I have to imagine that with all the fires and all of the liability that was, you know, laid at the doorstep of PG&E, um, they have a lot of expenses now to pay for, so they're not going to ease up on us anytime soon. No, that what they're doing now, along with Edison or SDG&E, is not changing. They, you know, for those that are in SDG&E territory, um, everyone is paying for the decommissioning of the San Onofre nuclear generating plant. Um, that makes sense. Right? So right. it's sitting there and you're paying for it every month on your bill. Take a look. It's sitting right there. So wow. the, you know, they pass along costs. Mm -hmm. Just like in the supply chain issues that everyone's experiencing today, mm -hmm. you get the benefit of having to pay more for that loaf of bread or that, that, that pound of beef. Mm -hmm. It's exactly the same thing. You have to pay more if you want to access. Now, the utility will always say, well, you know, s the electricity is variable. We don't know exactly how much we're going to need because they blame it on, on people that have solar on their roof. Uh, and then they say, well, we need to go into the spot market. It's called a spot market where you can buy electricity mm -hmm. just like you can uh, a stock. Wow. And so it's just another commodity. It's an, it is. That's exactly what it is. And, you, and they can buy it, you know, from New York or from Canada. But the customer is going to have to pay for that excess electricity that comes. And that's how they're able to justify being able to support their rate increases. So can you, can you back up to that blaming the people with, with solar? What is that argument that they're trying to make? Well, they're saying that the solar is not a consistent amount of power that's coming into their system because homeowners who use it, they use it for their own purposes first. Anything that's left over mm -hmm. then can go back into the grid and they can be credited for it. This is through a program called net energy metering. Mm -hmm. But more and more people are installing storage batteries in their homes, which is a great way to go. Of course. And so any excess electricity goes into the storage battery. And then they can rely upon that to help power systems, especially during the high peak periods where everyone gets nailed by the utility from, say, 4 to 9 p.m. And you see the ads into that on, higher category. Right, yes. exactly. And so you've seen the ads on TV where the utility says, you know, don't turn on your dishwasher, don't do laundry, or, or mm -hmm. turn on a bunch of TVs between 4 to 9 p.m. because you're going to get hit with the higher rates. So those are the times when the storage battery becomes so, so important to have because now you've got the excess power that's been stored. So the utility relies on that argument to support higher rates. It's just ridiculous. Yeah, it's it, a catch-22 situation. Exactly what I was thinking. It is a catch-22. So 
and getting back to the storage batteries, and I've heard that's a good idea, and it makes a lot of sense to me, especially since, as you had mentioned, electric vehicles are right. becoming more affordable. And as I see, when people are building new homes or getting ready to resell their home, right. um, installing an EV charger is almost a mandate now. But if you don't have your own um, power generating source, mm -hmm. how much does that drain a um, well, how much is that going to cost you as a homeowner, do you think? Is there a huge expense in terms of charging your car at home? And B, our cities and our, our grids, if you will, are they set up for this many electric vehicles to be charging in our homes? The infrastructure is weak, for sure, mm -hmm. but it is improving. But as far as, you know, first of all, homeowners who want to have a specific EV charging station, mm -hmm. uh, charger in their home, they if it's installed, uh, they will be able to get a 30% what's called an investment tax credit. So they'll get a tax credit from the government for 30% of the cost of the unit. Okay. All right. So that's the incentive. So there's the offset there. So um, now if someone doesn't want one of those, uh, it does not um, benefit them terribly by just plugging in the car uh, into a wall outlet, which is a 110 uh, volt su supply system. Mm -hmm. They need to have that, that outlet refitted by their electrician mm -hmm. uh, for like a 240 uh, volt uh, oh, system. Oh, I thought it was 220. It's 240. Or 220, I should say. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, 220. Yeah, 220. And um, it's like the plug for a dryer. Right. Okay. Exactly. So now you can plug in. And so, you know, what that does is it affects your charging time. So now mm -hmm. you can charge your car overnight and you'll, it should be ready to go the next morning. Right. But with an electric vehicle charging station in your house, that speed of charging is much higher. What does it cost? It depends on the company. Um, they can be, you know, typically a couple thousand dollars. Okay. But right. it's well worth the cost for sure. Well, and I'm glad to hear you talk about this because obviously this is in your wheelhouse when it comes to all things sustainable. Um, what about the argument that we're hearing some people make that these electric vehicles are actually quite toxic to produce? And then what happens to the batteries, you know, when the battery no is no longer viable? Do you have an opinion about that? Have you heard anything about this? Well, there are those who say, you know, lithium ion batteries are terrible because you're actually using a piece of carbon in the battery to create the, the charge. Is that the argument? Okay. Um, and then that, that's, that feeds into the disposal side of things. But, you know, these batteries, they last a long time. What is a long time? Um, I think they're warranted for 10 years at the outset, but you know, depending on how hard someone is driving their vehicle, mm -hmm. there's lots of used electric vehicles in the marketplace and one needs to check to see what the remaining ability is for that or the, the ability is for that, that battery to retain a charge. Mm -hmm. And that should guide them in whether that vehicle is per should be purchased or not. But batteries can be replaced. It's not a cheap ex uh, expenditure. Okay. Um, but it's uh, but they should you know if the person isn't putting 400 miles a day on their vehicle, you know that battery should easily last 10 to 15 years. And that's as long as most people keep a car anyway. So I get it. So then the issue just becomes disposal. Disposal. Sure. Exactly. And it, it's it's interesting. I'm I'm very familiar with with measuring how much charge is left on a battery because I have an implanted medical device. So there you go. I know that this can be checked. And I was very excited when I heard that Elon Musk was working on some technology. And I heard this years ago, so this may be done and gone by now. Right. But that he was working on technology to create a recharging environment. Right. So batteries could be brought into a room, if you will, and then recharged. Are you familiar with this? Is that actually happening? Yeah. We, we actually have a client right now that we're working with where yeah. they are producing, they have excess electricity. Uh, on a daily and monthly basis, and that goes into storage batteries. And then we, and I assume that this storage battery in this case is like the size of a generator. Okay. Like okay. So, and and um, and then that can be wheeled to the fleet of vehicles, and that electricity that's in the storage batteries can then be used to charge the batteries in the in the fleet of vehicles. So I love it. Yeah. So the portability of the entire system is improving. That infrastructure is getting better and better. If the if the federal government could find a way to uh, set up more portable, not so much portable, but s charging stations at mm -hmm. rest stops along highways and byways that are solar powered, mm -hmm. um, it would really improve the overall infrastructure and create that situation where people will embrace electric vehicles far faster. What a great novel idea. 
See, I love asking you these questions because you actually have answers. <laughs> I just wonder. Or I just fake it. One of the two. Yeah, well, you know, g fair enough. I mean, I, I, but I know that you're not that guy. I know. So I, I've gone down a rabbit hole of EVs and all that. But what other things should homeowners consider to be more energy efficient? Well, there's a whole bunch of things, whether it's a custom home or it's not a custom designed home. Most homes will have issues, whether it's poor insulation either or not, no insulation in the walls or in the attic. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes there's these holes that are behind the wall where an electric outlet is or where the plumbing is. So if that's not insulated, there's areas where, you know, air is leaking, which means that, you know, someone who may want their home really warm or really cold, that heat or cool air is escaping through those kinds of invisible, well, not and, to be seen spots. Right, and those small gaps can really add up. Right, and then there's gaps, you know, with windows, poor window ceilings, um, doors where you've got the uh, you've got the um, the rubber sealant that goes down the side of the door. Mm -hmm. It's cracked. It's old, so air is leaking out through there, or the door is not fitted properly. Windows, uh, you could have single pane windows. You really should have better windows in there. Um, sometimes there's just a lot of heat coming in through the back of the house uh, if it's facing south or southwest, right? Or through the front of the house doesn't make any difference. But if there isn't canopies or there isn't actual shading by trees. That means the house is being superheated from the sunlight. Mm -hmm. So there ha you have to find ways to be able to correct that problem. And we talk with homeowners about that, and especially for homeowners um, that have pools. Mm. They may be using old style water pumps for the pool. And uh, if they switch those out for not that expensive, 1500 to $2,000 for an energy efficient variable mm -hmm. speed pump will give them the ability to have that pump one hour of that pump running is the equivalent to eight hours on the old pump. That's incredible. Yeah, so it saves a lot of money for Something people. Something I never would have thought of. Right. So does your company or do you know of a company that will go out to someone's home and do an energy audit? Yeah, we will go out and we will do uh, a complete and thorough review of what's going on with the, com with the house. We want to know from the, from the homeowner what they're doing to use their electricity. Like, for instance, they might, s I'll ask the question, do you have a house or, or, or do you have a room or rooms in your house that are cold or hot mm -hmm. always? Mm -hmm. And that tells me, you know, there's either a blockage in the ducting from where the AC is, or maybe the AC unit where the heat pump is at the farthest end of the house. Mm -hmm. And the people that are living in the other end of the house right. are not benefiting from, you know, getting the heat or the coal uh, air. And so uh, there are ways to solve that problem. But people, you know, they, they don't think about that when they're buying a of house. Of course not. And sometimes they don't even think about, well, how old is that AC unit? Uh, that's there. When was the last time it was, you know, you know given the once over and, and uh, the coils were checked and the, and the vents were fixed? And because you see a lot of bent fins that are on AC yes, units. Yes, we do. And yes. so those, those, in, those prohibit proper airflow and, and create issues. And, you know, I think in my, you know, decades I'm not gonna say how many many decades in this industry I have only had one client ask to have their ducts cleaned yeah which kind of blew my mind I'm like you know how much stuff is blown through there in the last 20 years you might want to have that cleaned out yeah and you know and sometimes people say oh well I can control the AC by using uh, a house fan mm -hmm. and whole house fans are useful however those that install the uh, house fans uh, may not be taken into consideration the stuff that's on the attic floor. Now, if there's air, if there's insulation and it's well insulated, not that much of a problem. But typically, most homes do not have a, a lot of insulation in the walls. Mm -hmm. And so, we put in a whole house fan. That thing is sucking all the air from the you know the floors below mm -hmm. through that fan that's in the attic. Yeah. Up which and out. now it, I don't want to over dramatize this, but. If there's particulate matter that's on the floor of the attic, and we'll just leave no it. one has organic particulate matter in their attic. Exactly. So you <laughs> get these little these little torrents of, of like you know wind gusts, so to speak, that are going across the floor, and anything that's on the floor will then get dropped into that cavity space between the drywall and the and the wall of the house. That's called an interstitial cavity. And I love how you're trying not to gross me out, but it's kind of <laughs> grossing me out. It is gross. It is gross <laughs> to think about it. But that, you know, for people that are sensitive, that have got asthma or are sensitive to, you know, that kind of stuff, it can be quite disgusting. And one needs to be careful when they start doing projects like that. Wow. Okay. I have now learned how to artfully dance around particulate matter. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> All right, so a quick question, and again, yeah. this is I lean on professionals like you because I yeah. don't know much. What does net zero mean? <laughs> Why is it important? Well, net zero energy, what it means is that a home uh, needs to be able to produce as much electricity as the residents inside the home are using. Okay, so produce what you consume. Exactly. Now, there's no one going around by the government knocking on homes and saying, let me see your bill. I want to compare it to what you spend versus how much energy is actually being used mm. uh, and uh, what you're saving and, you know, and what you're producing. And so um, two years ago, a rule was enacted by the California state government that said that all new homes constructed needed to be net zero, no matter right. what. I saw that. Mm -hmm. And so, again, you know, no one's checking on that, but it does become an interesting point when someone wants to sell a home or someone wants to buy a home because, as we talked about before, if you're looking at a street and there's two or three homes on the street mm -hmm. and you've got a home that's 10 or 15 years old but it's, it's not, say, as energy efficient or net zero compared to the shiny bright toy that is in the development that's one, you know, a half a mile away, mm -hmm. you know, you're you're really up against it. That's how we were able to help owners by taking and upgrading their home. And we can make smart homes. We can help them, you know, embrace the technology and give them the ability to monitor every circuit in the house. We can I'm give, such a fan of that. Yes. Yeah, and improve it with special LED lighting, accent lighting, you know, roller shades. You can get shades that block out all the infrared light and mm -hmm. ultraviolet light so that the room is not being heated. And, you, you know, so... There's so many things that can be done to make that home smarter and energy efficient, which then gives you the same, st you know, puts you on the same stand mm -hmm. as those that have got supposedly a net zero home. It levels the playing field a there lot. And older homes can absolutely be updated this absolutely. way. Absolutely, absolutely. What I'm seeing, you know, boots on the ground, as it were, um, older homes with swimming pools were far less attractive in the past because people thought, ugh, the expense and right. the liability. But when you have solar panels or other power producing right. resources on the home, suddenly, especially with COVID, right. and they're like, I'd like to have my own pool and know that my kids are here where I can safely keep an eye on them. And it's not costing me an arm and a leg anymore. So it's super attractive in the market. Right. You know, solar, I know everyone, you know, everyone knows about solar because they've been telemarketed to death. Yes. Um, and it's a great way to go, but I always try to stress to homeowners, let's, try to fix the things inside the house that are costing you money to begin with. Let's, Absolutely. let's upgrade your lighting. Let's check your H, your HVAC system, which is air conditioning, ventilation, heating. Mm -hmm. Let's fix that. Let's check, let's check your windows. And then depending on what the client wants to spend, they might just say, you know what, I just want solar. And you know, that's fine. That's their prerogative. Um, but we don't want to go and spend money and replace one cost with the other. So it's always important to try and fix what's going on inside the house. Preventative measures make so much sense. Right. You know, and, and we've all done it. We've all walked by a door and felt the cold draft, you know, wafting in from outside. This Absolutely. is exactly the thing we can prevent. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, all right, I have a million more questions, <laughs> but but I have to take a quick break. And, and Paul, will you please tell us about our sponsor? Absolutely. Well, as you prove week after week, Wendy, you've got uh, an incredible group of partners you surround yourself with. And one of them is our sponsor for this show, Ford and Diulio. Ford and Diulio is an Orange County-based boutique litigation firm with experienced attorneys from big law firms. The partners who founded Ford and Diulio on the concept of an aligned interest with their clients, simply meaning that when they do good, you do good, and they're rewarded for being efficient and effective, not just dragging the litigation and the bills out, and where they engage in the relentless pursuit of their clients' goals, whether in litigation, mediation, or trial. If that's something you're missing, if that's something you need in your life, why not check them out? It's pretty simple. FordDiulio.com, just like it sounds, F-O-R-D-D-I-U-L-I-O. FordDiulio.com. Wendy, Wendy, how many hours have we got to talk here? i got a million <laughs> questions on this I one. know you do. Oh, Bring it, Paul. Oh, my goodness. All right, two, two real quick ones here. I'm in the process of upgrading my house to add solar to it. And partly my wife was motivated and I were, I hate to say it, we're sort of old hippies just because it sounds like a do good kind of thing for the planet. Uh, you know, let's let's all move in this direction. Even Arnold a few years ago, Arnold Schwarzenegger, wasn't he going to put, we were trying to encourage everybody to put solar on the roof and that kind of fizzled out. But one of the things that really struck with me, the logical part of me was the pitch, the telemarketers that came to our house. <laughs> 
And they said, you know, this is going to add value to your house and be kind of a must-have when you sell this thing in 10, 15 years. I'm at that age where I'm looking ahead. I'm going to get one chance to cash this thing out at some point in time here. Is that true? Or are they just give me a, a load of hooey here? Does it really add to the value of your house for either one of you here? And and is it really beyond the value add? Is it going to be a necessity when everybody's got electric cars and electric everything, electric bikes and everything here? Well, think? Okay, I'll field it first. I know you've Thanks. probably got your own opinions. I buddy. do. I do. Um, so there was a study done by Berkeley Labs a number of years ago. I'm going to say probably back in um, maybe 2000. Mm, let me think about this. I'm going to say maybe 2010, 2007, sort of in that ballpark. And, you know, they suggested that a house would increase by value by probably at least 10% by having solar on it. Uh -huh. I don't think that that actually has proven itself to be true. However, just going back to the previous conversation, if you are looking at two identical homes on the street and you want to buy it and one house has solar and one doesn't, you're going to sort of move your way towards purchasing the house that's got solar because Absolutely. it is making it's going to save you money now word of caution for those people that are thinking of buying solar or getting solar installed especially if they've got an electric vehicle it's a great way to go and you want to be able to have a storage battery for all the reasons that we spoke of earlier um the solar that gets installed is something which you should pay for you do i would I think it's a smart move to do it that way because if you are in a lease or a per power purchase agreement with the solar, and I'm not going to go into that, um, what happens is those will become conditions of escrow mm -hmm. when you sell the house. Mm -hmm, they do. And that can become a real hiccup for a lot of people. because Meaning you have to pay it off, right? Somebody you have to pay it off. Yeah. And those that qualify for a mortgage are not necessarily qualified mm -hmm. for the lien that's against the house mm -hmm. with, with or against the person's uh, house that's got the solar. That has been my observation too, that generally speaking, a home is more desirable when it is owned solar right. rather than leased solar. Right. Um, it, but having leased solar versus no solar is still usually a bit of an advantage, but there's a great disparity there's there's a wide range in these lease terms i'm seeing that's so right so some seem like they're a bit egregious people need to do their homework and they need to make sure that before they even go down the path of saying yes i want to do a deal they mm -hmm. need to research who are really good solar contractors what their length of history in the industry is what the reviews look like for these companies um you know you want to ask them pointed questions how long does it take to do an installation What's your history like? You know, what, what, how are you rated by the Better Business Bureau? All those kinds of questions that you would for anything else that you purchase, you want to get two or three quotes. You want to make sure you're going to get into bed because that with the right company. That's the company you're going to have with you right. for potentially, you know, 15, 20, 25 years. That makes sense. And can you recommend a third party vetting um, resource that consumers can go to to get? That there's a million solar everybody right. and their brothers is solar of course solar the better now. business yeah. bureau but is there another um i would say the, the the easiest way yes you can always check state sites if you go to california energy commission mm -hmm. they have a breakdown uh, but honestly even if you just googled uh solar companies and you say oh yeah here's sun power and here's sun this and there's mm -hmm. tesla that and you need to do the research. Okay. It's it's going to come down to spending, you know, an hour worth of time just trying to get comfortable with people. And I would ask people to resist the urge of pulling the trigger without having done the research because they may re live to regret it. And they all want you to do that. They come to your house and they want to close it that night. They right. do. And, oh, yeah. yes. Yes, that, that's the mantra for sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, what else you got, Paul? One more quick one. <laughs> I want to give a my own testimony. I want to testify on your show here uh, today. Here, I want to testify that I a couple of years ago had somebody come through the studio and said, "You should clean out your vents." And I got little grandkids, and I thought, you know, it's probably a smart idea. We've owned the house for twenty years. I never thought of cleaning the vents. So and had, how gross was it? It's. I'm going to tell you how gross. There was a dead rat in there. I've been breathing breathing a rotting dead rat for I don't know how many years. Yes. Yes, this is the organic particulate horrified. material we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, and rat feces and all kinds yeah. of yummy stuff. One had climbed there. into the vent and somehow and died, and I'm breathing this. So yeah, yeah please do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we, very true. Seen, uh, it it can be true. gruesome. 
All right. Well, if <clears throat> if we can put that to bed. Thank you <laughs> yes, so much. I just had to throw that in there. I, I've been through that particulate, that particular discussion about particulate. Yeah. Ugh. All right. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> so every week I like to close the episode by asking my own sort of version of the Vanity Fair Proust questionnaire. Hmm. So to get a, to know you, I mean, not just the professional person, but the individual, the human. So first question, because it's about real estate, what city do you call home? Um, Ladera Ranch. That's where I live. I did not know that. Yeah. So why and, and what do you love about living there? Uh, the why. Well, the why is that we wanted, we used to live in Cota de Casa, mm -hmm. and then we moved because we wanted someplace closer to the freeway system mm -hmm. so that we could get our kids to school. Um, but we also found out that it gave us uh, a cooler breeze in the summertime because we're closer to the ocean. So it, it was never that hot in the summertime for us, which is an added benefit. So Quite we love like living Coda. there. Yes. Well, and if the girls were younger, I mean, the amenities are amazing for children. Yeah. We, I mean, there's tons of swimming pools and of course, you know, close to the mall and all that stuff. So. Right. Right. Well, for the girls, the malls. It's a, exactly. It's a necessity. Yes. Right? For like, me, not so much. Can I ask one quick question? Because I remember when they built Ladera, I live right next door in Las Flores. There you little, go. And the, one of the selling features was uh, net zero, solar this, everything. Mm -hmm. they, everything was supposed to be much more energy efficient. Now, I know nobody's building new homes really anymore because there isn't any place to do it. But that was one of the last great developments. Maybe Rancho Mission Viejo that's there still building go. homes. Right. But the whole idea of it being uh, environmentally friendly, was that mm -hmm. a success? And was that a reason that you moved there? No, actually, it didn't have much to do with the reason why I moved there, but um, it's always an added benefit. And, you know, you, for me, I always look for homes. If we were to be buying, I, I want the home that's, that's got solar or can be outfitted with solar. And, and, you know, the roof, hopefully the backyard roof, no one seems to really like having solar panels on the front of their roof. So the, back, the backyard roof is sort of pointing in the right direction of southeast to west. And uh, so those are the kinds of things that I look for as far as, you know, new development, um, you know, coming back to what we were talking about before, uh, Ranch Mission Viejo uh, definitely has embraced the, uh, the idea of all homes having solar panels. And again, well, again, that was also mandated. So yeah. And who knows whether the number of panels is good or bad, because, you know, there could be six panels, but what the homeowner really needs is 12 panels. Right. Right. Yeah. Good questions, Paul. All right. Um, back to me. Yes. Mark, what is your most treasured possession? I'm going to say my health because I'll tell you, it's been, it's been a couple of rough years for me and, uh, you learn to appreciate the finer things in life when you're feeling well. I'm so glad you're well too, because we were all terribly concerned. Thank you. So it's Thank you. good to have you back and, and in the pink, literally. Yeah. So given all that you've done and you've lived in multiple countries and you've raised young women and as we were talking about before we went on the air you've had the opportunity to provide education globally right what do you consider your greatest accomplishment so far hmm. well you named it e e even though I, it's been great being successful and running my own business and and doing deals around the world uh greatest accomplishment is honestly marrying my wife that, oh. that set everything up for me. And, and I don't mean to be, you know, sappy about it, but, you know, all those other things would never have happened if I hadn't had her with me. You know, and I don't, I don't care what people say. I mean, human beings are social animals and we really want to love and be loved and right. to nurture and that you have found a life partner that, that you still embrace and enjoy and revere is glorious. Yeah, we're a good team. That's wonderful. And I'm so glad that she was there to help you through the rough spot. Oh, yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, what is, or if you have one, what's your personal motto? Focus on the big things. Don't let the daily trivial issues tie you up and create all the stress and anxiety that one always experiences. You need to rise above it. Especially now. Oh, Absolutely. I mean, with the pandemic, I, I'm sometimes surprised that people are fretting over such petty things. I'm like, you realize hundreds of thousands of people have died. Things so, get so politicized. It's 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 unfair to our own well-being to get caught up in that. It's regrettable. And so I'm glad that you focus on what matters. So I, I don't want to forget. I want everyone to know how to reach you because we haven't begun to scratch the surface of what right. you do. How can people reach you? Um, I'm always open for consultations um, and to speak with people on the phone or by Zoom. 
uh, or if they want, um, if it's uh, times available, I'll come and visit them at their home. Uh, they can reach me, my phone number, uh, I'll, my office number is 949-365-5823, again 949-365-5823, or they can email me at m, as in Mark, Brenner, with one N, at E-E-I-N-T-L dot com. Perfect. And for anybody who didn't have a pen handy, we will put that on our podcast site as well. So look for that. And please join us next week. We're going to interview Amy Valdivia with American Financial Network. And she's not just another mortgage person. She actually has incredible insights about how to leverage mortgages to make your divorce, one's divorce, a little bit easier. Mm. It's never easy. And of course, follow me, Wendy Ross and Veracity Real Estate Company on Instagram, LinkedIn, and subscribe to our podcast wherever it is you most like to listen to your podcasts. Thanks. See you next week. Thank you.